You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Tax Smart REI Podcast. In this episode, we're joined with Taylor Brugner, who's a partner here at the firm. And uh, Taylor's going to tell us all about how he built a $30 million portfolio consisting of 134 units, all within less than 10 years. So that's super exciting. And we're going to talk about that in just one second after a quick word from our sponsor. Conventional investment strategies are changing. Gone are the days of investing in real estate strictly off of pro forma spreadsheets. The new market landscape has many investors reevaluating their portfolios and looking for the best place to passively earn a safe, consistent return. The Dual City Advantage Fund is an evergreen 506C open-ended fund that specializes in investing in commercial real estate. Dual City's ideal investor is an accredited investor who wants a portion of their portfolio in passive and diverse real estate investments without having the high risks of a single syndication. The Dual City Advantage Fund is outpacing public REIT ETFs by more than double, and while the rest of the market has been in flux, it has delivered consistent quarterly returns to its investors since its inception. To learn more about Dual City's value, strategies, and long-term vision, visit DualCityInvestments.com or call 864-757-2429. Again, that's dualcityinvestments.com or call 864-757-2429. Without further ado, we'll jump right into today's episode. Before we dive right into Taylor's story, just wanted to kind of let everybody know if you do want to learn more about what Taylor has going on, learn a little bit more about Taylor's journey and how he can help you. He did conduct a masterclass in the TaxSmart Insiders Group uh, that is available for replay where he went through how to manage your property manager, different types of real estate debt you can use to build your portfolio, and a few other great things. So you can go learn all about that by becoming a TaxSmart Insider if you're not already at www.taxsmartinvestors.com slash free trial. You get a 30-day free trial and check all that out. But without further ado, Taylor, thanks for coming to the show today. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Anytime. So kind of just to kick it off here, we know your story. Some people might have heard it before. You built a 134-unit portfolio worth $30 million in under 10 years, which is an amazing feat. Could you kind of just walk us through a little bit about your journey and how you kind of stumbled upon real estate investing in the first place? Absolutely. So I will try to keep it short and sweet because I've learned a ton of lessons along the way and I could talk about it forever. But uh, in college, my now wife and I started an eBay business where we used to sell clothing from outlet stores online to customers that didn't have access to that type of sale or, or discounted price. So it was a great business. We were fortunate that it did really well at that time. But as we graduated, college and started working into high stress jobs. I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers in a very stressful accounting role, and my wife was in finance. Um, I needed something that was going to provide income like that business, but also be a lot more passive. So naturally, I was drawn to the concept of long-term rental real estate investing, because I knew that it would provide a level of return on the capital that we've already built, but it wasn't going to take up all of that time like the eBay business did. So I was able to actually focus on my accounting career, grow my skill set there, but also at the same time, have a real estate side hustle going. Interesting, interesting. So you had a full-time job the entire time, but you were able to still jumpstart this portfolio. When you first dove in, like, how were you able to do this, you know, having a full-time job? Yeah, I will admit it was challenging at first because the first couple of units I bought were really just an educational experience, a huge learning curve where everything that was happening was just brand new to me. And I kind of had to figure out, was this normal in the real estate world? So what I did to to try to mitigate that as much as I could was I started small. So I started with four condo units in Tampa. They were, I think, $30,000 at the time. So relatively low risk, kind of based on what I was comfortable with. And I just knew that things wouldn't be perfect. I knew that I would make mistakes along the way. But I still I still talk about those condo units all the time as far as the experience I've learned, how to screen tenants, how to deal with repairs and maintenance, how to hire a property manager. All of that happened from that small initial investment. So nice, nice. And I and I know from there, you know, I think you eventually sold the condos and then you used, you know, the Burr strategy to build your portfolio. How did that all play together for you? Yeah. So I know it it happened in a relatively short time. I know that it's only been eight or nine years at this point. 
But really, I was fortunate that my wife and I had well-paying jobs that were, of course, working full-time. And basically, every dollar of cash flow would get reinvested back into the next unit. And then every dollar of refinance capital also was into the next unit. So how it worked over those past 10 years or so is, fortunately, those markets were appreciating. Every three to four years, I would do a cash-out refinance. I would take that extra extra cash and just plow it into the next unit. So there wasn't any kind of magic uh, system behind it. It was just improving the properties, making sure that they were appreciating, along with market conditions to help, of course, taking that cash and just keep growing from there. And I learned that if it's one condo unit or if it's a 12-unit apartment building, or even if it's a 20-unit apartment building, the level of knowledge required, the system in place is actually extremely similar. So it allowed me to grow at a relatively rapid pace because I wasn't changing what I was doing. I was just getting purchase prices a little bit higher each time. What sort of financing were you using on this? Are you doing like 30-year fixed rate loans? Yeah, great question. So because I, I'm married, I was able to use 20 conventional mortgages to get started. So each person is allowed 10 conventional loans. And that's exactly what you were just describing, Brandon. It is a 30-year fixed rate loan. Uh, when I started, rates were at 5 6%. I think they did eventually dip down into the, into the threes at that peak of really low rates. And now they're back up to similar points. But that 30-year loan qualifying for conventional financing is generally the best terms you're going to get into in that small multifamily space. So I started with that. And then as soon as we maxed out our 20 loans and it started becoming way too complicated because all the all the tax returns, all the underwriting required, then I started working with commercial banks to just kind of make that process a bit more simple. Now, terms are a bit worse, but standard for kind of what that that commercial loan looks like. It's So it's shorter amortization than 30 years. And generally, the fixed interest rate periods are generally from anywhere from five to 10 years. How does working with commercial banks make it easier to get the financing? Like, is their process yes. simpler? Yep. So the reason why it's easier is because a Fannie Mae has very strict guidelines of what you need to do to qualify. It's a certain level of income. It's a certain level of reserves, a credit score, for example, where a commercial bank, it's very relationship-based. And if they trust you as an operator. So there have been some deals where it didn't make sense on paper. So for example, I just bought this eight unit maybe a year ago. I think rents were like 5,000 a month in total. And the purchase price was like 1.1 million. So from an underwriting perspective, it makes no sense. But I knew that I could double rents pretty much immediately. And then on paper, it would work. So a small commercial bank is going to be able to look through some of that and trust me as the investor and then give me some more flexibility to actually get a loan done. So okay. it's, it's just easier to get a loan is the long story short. That makes sense. Now, how has your financing strategy changed today in our higher interest rate environment? Yeah, great question. So there are still plenty of deals out there. There are a lot of situations where things hold true in high interest rate environments and low interest rate environments. So for example, maybe you have a tired landlord coming up and wants to sell a property. That happens if rates are 3% or if they're 6%. There might be estate sales. There might be things where a seller is auctioning off a property for a variety of reasons. So there are still de deals to be had. The, the financing strategy hasn't changed. Uh, yes, rates are higher, but I just make sure that if I'm doing my analysis, as long as I'm still cash flowing and, and the deal still works, I'm fine paying 6% because I have a high degree of confidence that at some point, the rates are going to drop down to a lower rate. I could always refinance immediately at that time. So... So it kind of sounds like it's always a good time to buy real estate, it's just a matter of finding the right deals and making sure they they underwrite properly. Exactly right. So I would say, actually, there was a period when rates were kind of just spiking and going up pretty dramatically. I'd probably say, I don't know, I don't know eight to 10 months ago, roughly, where there was this weird thing going on in the market, at least in the ones that I operate in, that buyers... We're still expecting super low rates. Sellers were expecting really high prices still. 
And there was kind of this standstill where sellers wouldn't drop their price, but a buyer wouldn't accept that high of a bid and then pay a 6% loan on top of it. So now that things have kind of settled down a bit, I think sellers are being more realistic in their pricing. And I think buyers are being more accepting of rates being where they are. So I'm noticing at least a lot more deals, a lot more activity is happening. And there are still deals out there that cash flow time. So I'm I'm excited to kind of get back in there, start looking for my next one, because there was a time about a year ago that it was really challenging to get a deal done. And now it's just starting to open up again. What markets are you looking at? So I am in Tampa and St. Petersburg primarily. I'd like to diversify out at some point and actually invest more local to where I live. So I'm based in Dallas. So I'm currently looking kind of an hour to two hour drive outside of Dallas. And then also, of course, because I've got the whole system in place in Tampa and St. Pete, I will always look there no matter what, because it's just it's it's the path of least resistance for me to acquire a, a new property. Are you looking for a law firm that can handle your real estate transactions with expertise and efficiency? Thrasher Law Offices is a premier boutique law firm specializing in real estate acquisitions, private placement syndications, debt and equity financings, and corporate transactions. Their team of experienced attorneys understands the complexities of real estate transactions from purchase agreements to fund offerings and everything in between. Thrasher Law Offices advises their clients on structuring transactions for real estate development acquisitions, debt and equity financings, commercial leasings, and has extensive experience in private placement syndications, helping businesses raise capital through private offerings. Thrasher Law Offices builds long-term relationships with the clients they serve, creating strategies and opportunities, not just for today, but for your future needs as well. With their knowledge and expertise, you can trust that Thrasher Law Offices will guide you through the legal process with ease and confidence as you make critical decisions that will shape the future of your business. Visit www.thrasherpllc.com to learn more and schedule a free consultation. Again, to learn more and schedule a free consultation, visit www.thrasherpllc.com. The link will also be in the show notes, but for right now, we'll dive right back into today's episode. You have a course you're going to be coming out with soon that's going to walk people through how they can jumpstart their portfolio or scale their portfolio further. We'll get into that in a little bit. But you know, for someone who's maybe just starting out today, you know, what type of advice would you have for them? Yeah. So the number one thing I typically see is people get really stuck in what we call analysis paralysis. And we talk about this all, all the time. But uh, someone just starting... I didn't know what I was doing when I bur- when I bought my first four. I mean, I had an educated guess of the market that I wanted to be in because of things going on in that area. But I knew to some extent that first deal was going to be a learning experience. So my best advice is that you could only learn so much prior to jumping in. I think once you have some degree of confidence, it's time to just kind of jump in and start learning by actually doing. Right, right. Yeah, that's true in so many different endeavors in life. When it comes to you know building a portfolio, you know, especially today where we are at in the market, how much capital do you think someone would need to get started? That's a great question. I think there's a lot of real estate gurus out there who will kind of market themselves and say, "Oh, you don't need a dollar of capital, and all of a sudden you could have ten million dollars and be super rich in real estate." I don't think that's realistic, but I also think that. A good base is something that that you're willing to risk and you're willing to lose, but also it's it's not going to significantly affect the rest of your life as your the ability to pay bills, the ability to live your normal day to day life. So to answer your question, I'd probably say a twenty five to thirty percent down payment on whatever you're looking at, plus three to six months of a mortgage payment as a reserve. So whatever that looks like for you probably a safe number. Great advice. You mentioned before you started off with condos, right? Uh, And I know everybody always wants to go big, right? They want to jump right into multifamily. I know that's how I was kind of trained uh, from my my real estate investing experience. But could you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, you suggest diving right into the bigger multifamily or, you know, would you suggest maybe starting small with a condo or a a single family rental? Sure. So I think kind of uh, piggybacking off of what I just said on my earlier point, I think it's really about what you're comfortable allocating to real estate in your overall investment portfolio. The reason why I say that is because I've owned condo units, uh, single family homes, all the way up to, I think, uh, a 20 unit building. 
And the actual process to own the assets and to manage them is really the same, exact same, until you get to about 40 units. And the reason why it's different at 40 is because you need to have somebody on site and you're running payroll. And now you're managing a person. So you have somebody on site who's leasing units, handling small maintenance items, maybe. So really, anything from one unit to about 40 is going to be a very similar management strategy. So really, just whatever you're comfortable with. Got it, got it. So you don't have to just dive right into the big stuff right away. You kind of start small if you want and you know take it one step at a time. Exactly. Uh, I think you'll get very similar experience investing in a four unit versus a 12 unit, for example. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, you know, and I know in, in your strategy, you, you utilize Burr, right? You mentioned that you refinanced out. Um, I know for a lot of people, you know, who are maybe just starting out, that could be like an intimidating experience, right? You have to um, maybe have to manage a construction crew or have to oversee different types of contractors during the renovation process. And if they're doing it from a distance, it could be challenging, right? What's your advice there? Do you suggest jumping right in and using Burr or do you suggest dipping your toe in the water with something a little bit more, you know, I guess a little bit more of a base hit, if you would say. Yeah. So I think if I were starting in 1990 or something like that, I think investing remotely would be really difficult and really intimidating. Uh, thanks to all the wonderful technology that we have now, it's not as large of, of a concern as you would think. So I've got a property manager, of course, who's got a very good camera phone who, who can take videos of anything that I need to see at any time. As soon as you find a contractor or two that you trust, a kind of same thing there, walkthrough videos are super helpful. Being able to understand exactly what's wrong, uh, generally 95% of the time, I can get a very clear understanding of the condition of a unit, a condition of the property by just one, talking to my contractor and property manager, but two, watching that walkthrough video in detail. And they've gotten really good at, at doing those videos too, because there is a little bit of a skill to it that if you're just starting, sometimes you kind of fly through the unit and you really can't see much because it's blurry and the person's walking too fast or things like that. But if you start walking slow, really zooming in on what's wrong, you can get a really good idea for what's going on. So as long as you have someone who's willing to communicate with you, I think investing remotely is a great place to start. So this market's kind of challenging. You kind of touched on it a little bit. You said there are still deals to be had, but there are a lot of concerns. People seem to be like on edge. Is now a good time to start investing or, or to expand your portfolio if you've already got a handful of properties or should you kind of wait until maybe into 2023, 2024 to see what the market does? So I'm of the mindset that if a deal works, there's no reason not to get it done at any time. I mean, historically speaking, a, a real estate has kept up with inflation and then some. And I think it's a great vehicle to offset a lot of the inflation that we that we have been experiencing. And then I think the other thing that I would be, I, I'd, I'd be mindful of is that in this higher interest rate environment, probably doesn't make sense to lock yourself into high interest rate debt with huge prepayment penalties uh, going forward, because there is this huge flexibility that you lose by not being able to refinance. So to answer your question, if the deal still works and you have flexible enough debt that you are able to get out of it at some point, I think that is enough to just keep going through this little bit of an uncertain situation. All right. And I know we kind of discussed interest rates and all of that, but real estate is also about location, location, location. What factors, like for someone just starting out maybe, or someone who's looking to expand their portfolio and they just want to make sure they're in the right spot, what factors do you look at when evaluating a market to minimize your downside risk? It's a really great question. And I think a common mistake new investors make is that they only look at deals on paper. And what I mean by that is if you look at a market, let's say in the Midwest, in a rural area, on paper, it's going to look great. And the purchase price relative to the amount of rent you're getting is going to be a lot better than, for example, a Midwest city or maybe somewhere in the Southeast that has more demand. And the reason for that is because there's going to be a lot of associated vacancy with a property like that. There might be a lot less demand for the unit. So it takes, instead of a month to rent, it might take four months to rent. So there's other qualitative factors when analyzing a market that you can't just look at 
okay, the projected rent is $2,000 a month and the purchase price is, is $150,000. Sounds great. There's other factors. So when I'm looking at a market, I'm really looking at population growth. I'm looking at the employment statistics. And I'm also looking at the overall vacancy for a region. And Tampa St. Pete, while it's not the cheapest market out there, I rent most of my units in two or three weeks, which is a very strong uh, market for long-term rentals. Nice, nice, nice. It's all very important stuff. So I, I know that you're actually creating a course right now to break down all of the stuff, all the knowledge and experience that you've accumulated over the last 10 years building your portfolio, but basically so you could help other investors build theirs. Would you kind of be able to just kind of to talk a little bit about what's going to be in that course and you know what will people learn and take away from that course after they take it? Sure. So the goal of this course is basically taking all the experience that I've gained over the past 10 years of buying long-term rentals and trying to help somebody else get started to buy their first handful of properties. So what I try to do is I try to break it out into a couple of important topics that, that I think are, are really key to know and just break down all of the different things in each of those topics. So an example might be, how do you assemble your remote team? So the people that you need, uh, what does a good a, a title company look like versus uh, one that's underperforming? Or what does a good property manager look like? Another might be is now that you've acquired properties, how do you actually manage them? And how do you stay on top of your manager? So some people think that, oh, I'm just hiring a property manager. I don't have to do a single thing besides collect rent checks. That's not true if you want optimum cash flow to start kind of buying your next property, right? So it might be how to assemble a team, how to manage a property manager, how to look at certain types of debt. So all topics like that are trying to help somebody buy their first few properties and then hopefully grow past that point. Nice. And when it comes to underwriting, I know underwriting is a big, a big topic. If someone gets a property, they have to they have to put it in their Excel spreadsheets and and make sure the numbers make sense. Do you also help them with the underwriting as as a part of your course? Yeah. So uh, one of the modules in the course, Tom, is going to be how I underwrite all of my deals. And I'm also going to include the actual calculator that I use as well. So I'll I'll go through exactly how I look at long term rentals, how I estimate expenses kind of what I project the cash flow to be, and then when I think a good time to refinance might be as well. So if somebody comes through your course, what are they going to know at the end? Or, or what are they, they going to be ready to do at the end? Like what's yeah. the transformation? So the ultimate goal is going to be that they have the confidence to go ahead and start making offers on properties and start actually closing deals. So I'm trying to get people out of that analysis and learning phase into the actual doing phase. So there's also going to be a module on how to actually make an offer and get a property under contract. So just trying to take that next step is really where I want everybody to go. And what sort of tools are you going to be giving them? So the main one is going to be the calculator on how to analyze your property and then a second tool is going to be how to manage your property manager and what metrics that I use on a regular basis and keep track of those a month over month to make sure that the owner and the property manager are on the same page. And what more can you ask for in a course, right? It's, it's like how to make an offer on the property, then once you take it down, how to manage your property manager, make sure it goes effectively. And then, of course, the underwriting, you know, when you're evaluating offers. So that's awesome, man. I'm going to be I'm going to be a student in the course for sure. I can't wait to take it. And so if you're listening to this and you want to join in on the course, we are going to have a limited seating for the first kind of initial go of the course. So if you do want to uh, reserve your seat, you can go to www.taxmartinvestors.com slash crash course. And you could uh, join the waitlist and you'll be one of the first people to hear about it as soon as we get started. So again, it's www.taxmartinvestors.com slash crash course. I tell her, I want to thank you again for coming on the show today, sharing your, your knowledge and experience with the listeners. And we'll catch everybody on the next episode of Tax Smart REI. 